Hey everybody, today we're gonna continue talking about genetics. Uh, yesterday we talked about the basics. Uh, so remember we discussed genotypes and phenotypes. A genotype is the complete set of alleles or forms of a trait that an organism has. So for us, we have two parents. Each parent gave us an allele for every trait. So every trait we have has two alleles present. We represent that genotype with letters. Yesterday, we looked at using two different letters to represent a genotype. Uh, today, we're gonna look at using the same letter, but in different cases. Uh, so with genotypes, you can be homozygous and both parents gave you the same form of that trait, or you can be heterozygous and each parent gave you a different form of that trait. Uh, your phenotype is how those traits, how those alleles work together to give you an appearance of the organism. So the phenotype you can think about as what the organism looks like. Um, how does that trait end up functioning? So we looked at two inheritance patterns, incomplete dominance and codominance. Remember that incomplete dominance, you're going to see a blending of the two traits in your heterozygote. So for example, we had a red flower and a white flower. Remember I told you to think about these little R's as W's, okay? And the red flower and the white flower, we can get a, a gene from each of those to give us a pink flower. So with incomplete dominance, you have three phenotypes, three appearances, but there's still only two alleles, either red or white. And the heterozygote is a mixture, a blend of those two traits. We also looked at codominance. Codominance is when you have a checkered or a spotted appearance in your heterozygote. Um, so with codominance, you can see here we have a red and a white spotted flower. We have a black and a white spotted chicken. Um, so you still have three phenotypes. I could have a full black chicken, a full white chicken, or a black and white spotted chicken. But I still only have two alleles. I have the allele for black and I have the allele for white. And when I have both present, then I get this checkered appearance. So we practiced with that yesterday. Today we're going to talk about simple dominant and recessive traits. So these are traits where you're only going to have two phenotypes. You either have this trait or you have this trait. You can roll your tongue or you can't roll your tongue. You are either red or you are white, but you cannot blend the two colors with dominant and recessive. So dominant alleles are what is going to show up in the heterozygote. You only need one of these alleles in order for the dominant trait to be present. With recessive alleles, you need two of the alleles in order for the gene to actually show up. So we represent our dominant alleles with big letters and we represent our recessive alleles with lowercase letters and we use the same letter. Um, because your dominant trait is going to overpower that recessive trait. So in your practice, you have rabbits with brown fur or black fur. There's only two phenotypes, brown or black. The brown is dominant to the black. So what that means, if I have a heterozygous individual, brown is going to show up because I only need one of those brown traits in order to have a brown rabbit. I need two black traits in order to have a black rabbit. So the outcome of a cross between a heterozygous brown rabbit and a black rabbit, that's what we're gonna be looking for. So we're gonna use our steps to solving any genetics problem. First, we need to determine the type of cross we have. Well, we know this is just dominant and recessive. It's not incomplete or codominance. Those would require three phenotypes and we only have two. We either have black fur or brown fur. So that tells us this is either dominant or recessive. The next step is we need to determine our parents. Well, we have a heterozygous brown rabbit, so we know it's gonna have two different alleles. It's gonna have one big B for brown, and it's gonna have the other allele for black. And we also have a black rabbit in this cross, and to get a black rabbit, you're gonna need two black alleles because this is a recessive trait. It's gonna hide if the brown allele is present. So then we're gonna, um, step three, analyze our, or fill in our Punnett square. So we're gonna bring everything from the top down and we're gonna bring everything from the side across. And then we are going to do our fourth step, which is to analyze our Punnett square as to what color of rabbits we have in this case. So here we have one dominant allele. That's enough to give us the dominant form of the trait, which is brown. We have the same thing here. We have one big B, which means we're gonna have a brown rabbit. Here we have two little bees, which means we have no brown allele. So this rabbit is gonna to have to be black and same thing for this rabbit. 
when we're doing our geno and phenotypic ratios, your genotypic ratio is going to look at the types of genes that you have. So we have two heterozygous rabbits to two homozygous recessive rabbits. Okay, we can reduce this to um, one heterozygous to one homozygous recessive. For every one of these, you have one of these. Okay, you can reduce that. If we're looking at the phenotypic ratio, then we have two brown rabbits to two black rabbits. We could again reduce this to one brown rabbit to one black rabbit. In your next practice problem, we have freckles are dominant to no freckles. So two phenotypes, you either have freckles or you don't. Um, so we'll use big and little letters to represent freckles and not freckles. So what would be the outcome of a cross between two heterozygous parents? So we're gonna go through our steps to solving a genetics problem again. And the first step is to figure out the type of cross we have. Well, we only have two phenotypes, freckles or no freckles. So that indicates that we're using dominant and recessive inheritance. It's not incomplete or codominance because we don't have a third form of uh, this trait, it's either freckles or no freckles, no middle ground. The next step is to determine our parent genotypes. So our parents were heterozygous for freckles. That means they're gonna have a gene for freckles and they're gonna have another gene for no freckles. And both parents were heterozygous so we're going to put that in both places. Now, our third step is to fill out our Punnett square. So everything that's on the top is going to come down and everything that's on the side is going to come across. And I like to be consistent and always list my big letter first if it's present. Once we've got all of our boxes filled in for our zygotes, our potential offspring, then we need to do step four and analyze our Punnett square. So with this one, you have at least one gene for freckles. So this organism is gonna have freckles. We have at least one gene for freckles here. So the other gene doesn't matter. It's gonna be masked by the freckle gene. And same for this one, our offspring is gonna have freckles. And for this bottom one, you have no gene for freckles. So that means this um, zygote is not gonna have the potential to have freckles. Now the fifth part of our genetics problem is to answer the question. So let's look at the geno and phenotypic ratio. So the genotypic ratio here, we have one um, homozygous dominant, we have two heterozygous, and we have one homozygous recessive. There's no way to reduce that. That's what we're gonna have for our genotypic ratio. For our phenotypic ratio, we have three people here that are gonna have freckles to one person who will not have freckles. And so our pheno and genotypic ratios are not the same um, necessarily when we are doing a cross with, income, uh, with um, dominant and recessive inheritance patterns. Now keep in mind when you're looking at a Punnett square, you have uh, a parent organism that has two alleles for a trait and those two alleles are gonna be separated into different gametes. So that's what we're looking at here on the side. This is one potential gamete, this is another potential gamete, like an egg, for example. Up here you have one potential gamete, like a sperm, and here we have another potential sperm. Um, the crossing of these two traits represents fertilization, and what you have as an outcome in the boxes is gonna represent your zygote and what genes your um, embryo is gonna have when it grows up. You do not have to do this assignment. I haven't even told you about pedigrees yet, but it is fun if you want to uh, look at some of these traits and see what you and your parents have. Uh, so everything in this column is a dominant trait. It means you only have to have one gene from one parent in order to give you this trait. Everything in this column over here, you have to have two recessive traits from both parents in order to have these traits. So every one of these genes is coded for by one spot in your chromosome and only one gene is gonna control this. So whether or not you're a tongue roller, can you do this with your tongue? Okay, that if you can, then that's a dominant trait. Only one parent had to give that to you. Astigmatism, which is a very common eye problem. Um, if one parent gave you the gene for astigmatism, you're probably gonna need glasses. In order to have normal vision, both parents had to give you a recessive trait. Uh, freckles is a dominant trait. We already looked at that. One parent gives you the gene for freckles and you're gonna have that trait. 
Dimples in your cheeks, these little, little divots right here. Dimples is a dominant trait. Um, flat feet is a recessive trait. So if you do have flat feet, then um, you have both parents to blame for that. They both gave you a trait for that. PTC is a very bitter chemical. I actually have some PTC paper that you can taste if you're in class to see if you uh, have this dominant trait or not. But only one parent had to give you the trait for tasting this bitter chemical. Widow's peak, whether or not you have this point here, I have a slight one, uh, that is a dominant trait. Uh, double jointed thumb is dominant, broad lips, polydactyly, having more than five fingers or more than five toes on a hand or a foot is a dominant trait. Um, it is a trait that arises spontaneously sometimes, it's a mutation, but uh, it is also a mutation that popped up in Amish communities. And since Amish people tend to have children with other Amish people, um, polydactyly is a trait that you see a lot in uh, Amish communities. Syndactyly is also a dominant trait. This is when you have webbed fingers or webbed toes when you're born. Um, there is webbing between your fingers and toes when you're an embryo, but you have a gene that's gonna go in and, and take care of those cells and kill them off so that when you're born, your fingers and toes are separated. But if you have the dominant form of this trait, then you're not gonna be able to destroy those cells and you'll be born with webbed fingers or webbed toes. Achondroplasia is a, um, a nice word for dwarfism. So dwarfism is a dominant trait. You only need one trait from your parent to be a, a short person. Uh, however, being homozygous for achondroplasia is lethal. And we'll look at that here in just a minute. Huntington's disease uh, is a devastating disease that um, occurs as you get older. If one parent has that, that's a dominant trait, they will know that they have Huntington's disease. So this is something you would wanna be tested for if you knew that your parent had Huntington's to see if they pass that trait on to you. Um, having alb albinism, being an albino, having um, very little skin pigmentation is a recessive trait. So you need both parents to give you an albino gene in order to be albino and not produce pigment in your skin, eyes, hair or any of, of your body. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Tay-Sachs disease is a recessive trait. Both parents would have to give you a trait to have Tay-Sachs. And Tay-Sachs uh, presents itself in childhood. Most children that have Tay-Sachs do not live past five years old. You did a uh, web quest on Tay-Sachs earlier in the year. So you might remember this is caused by a missing enzyme called hex A in the lysosome. And missing that enzyme means that you can't digest certain molecules and they're gonna build up causing all kinds of problems and it is a lethal disease. Cystic fibrosis, this is another really tough disease to deal with. Most people with cystic fibrosis um, make it into their late 30s, early 40s, and it's getting better. We're, we're coming up with ways to treat cystic fibrosis, but in order to have cystic fibrosis, both parents would have had to give you a copy of that trait. So, so let's look at achondroplasia a little bit more. Remember that achondroplasia is dwarfism and dwarfism is dominant, which means only one parent has to give you the trait for dwarfism in order for it, you to be a little person. Every person who is affected by achondroplasia is heterozygous for that trait. They have one dominant mutated form of the gene and they have one normal form of the gene. Being homozygous dominant, having two forms of the dwarfism trait is lethal. Those offspring would be um, miscarried because they do not have enough protein from that normal gene in order to survive. So they don't have the normal gene. So if we have two heterozygous people for dwarfism, that means they're gonna have one dominant dwarfism trait and they're gonna have one normal recessive gene. And if we are putting two heterozygotes together and we cross them, then here we have a homozygous dominant individual here we have a heterozygous individual. Here we have a heterozygous individual and here we have a homozygous recessive individual. So let's go through and analyze what this means. This organism would not survive, this is lethal, okay? So we can just um, cross them off. You have a 25% chance here of having a miscarriage if uh, two people with achondroplasia have a child. Um, we have here, the dwarfism gene, so they will have dwarfism. 
And here we have the same thing. So this individual will have dwarfism. And here we have the normal form of the gene. So this person will be of normal height. So when two people with a chondroplasia or dwarfism have a child, you have a 25% chance of having a normal offspring with normal height, a 25% chance of a miscarriage, and a 50% chance that the offspring will have dwarfism. So just an interesting uh, genetic trait in humans. So go ahead and complete the practice for this section and turn it in. And tomorrow you're going to have a fun little lab on uh, making a baby. So you're going to use two coins um, to determine the genes of your baby. And at the end, once you've determined all of these different traits, then you're going to uh, draw out the baby and turn that in as well. And I'm going to post a little video on how to do that. So I look forward to, uh, to doing that lab with you. Have a great day and we'll see you tomorrow.